morning. Welcome to the morning worship service of Harvest Presbyterian Church. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, limited announcements on page 10. I'll let you all review those at your all's leisure. And I uh, just also wanted to remind each other that uh, out on the front table, uh, there's a little half sheet of uh, prayer requests for the church. Uh, I know I use it to uh, guide myself when I uh, uh, pray uh, for all of you. Um, so I ask you to remind yourself to pick that up and you can, uh, we can all pray uh, for others in the church uh, throughout the week. And with that, let's uh, turn our attention to the reason why we're here is to worshiping our risen Lord and Savior. Uh, so would you please take a minute to uh, quiet your heart and minds before I call us into worship. All right, please stand as we call each other to worship, or as I call us into worship with these, uh, uh, with these words from Psalm chapter 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let us continue to praise him by singing, Come, Christian, Join to Sing, found in your Red Trinity hymnals. Christ our King. Alleluia. Amen. Let all with heart and voice before His throne rejoice. Praise is His gracious choice. Alleluia. Amen. Come lift your hearts on high. Alleluia, amen. Let praises fill the sky. Alleluia, amen. He is our guide and friend. To us he'll condescend. His love shall never end. Alleluia, amen. Praise yet our Christ again. Alleluia, amen. Life shall not end the strain. Alleluia, amen. On heaven's blissful shore, his goodness will adore, singing forevermore. Alleluia, amen. Let us call upon God together as his people. I lift my eyes to the hills, from where does my help come? Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us pray together. Our Father and our God, the idols of the earth are nothing. You alone are the living and true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. Praise is your glorious choice uh, this day and for all eternity. And so we come to, to praise you for your great salvation. The gracious, merciful God that you are to save us from our sins. To give us everlasting life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for our Savior and his perfection. 
his beauty, that we behold him even this day by faith. And so strengthen our souls as we gather to to praise you and to hear from you, to call upon you, to confess our sins before you, Lord. We long to be changed by you, to be more and more like you, loving and gracious and holy. Oh Lord, change our hearts for your glory this day and receive our praise and adoration. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. To the church of God gathered in Jacksonville, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Holy Scripture, our our Lord tells us in Holy Scripture that we are uh, to be holy as He is holy. And one of the ways we we love is by loving our enemies. Jesus said that that sometimes our enemies will be those in our own household. Now, He didn't mean Christians, husbands and, and wives and children and parents. But life is very bitter at times, and sometimes those we love seem as they are our enemies, and we don't pray for them. And we harbor bitterness in our hearts toward them, unforgiveness toward them. And there are enemies out in the world that we must pray for too. So here, the Lord call us to confess our sins from His Holy Word in Luke chapter 6. But I say to you who hear, hear. May you hear, dear Christian. But I say to you who are here, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who abuse you. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. There's a lot that we can confess. But first, let us call upon the Lord and sing to Him to have mercy upon our souls. Let us sing to the Lord together. confess our sins before our merciful God together. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry 
and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us so that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let us confess our sins silently before the Lord. Our Father and our God, we uh, come to you, the God who does not treat us as our sins deserve. We confess before you our pride that holds so fast to, to bitterness at times. Forgive us for the way that we fail to love our enemies, for the way we fail to love you. You are good. You do nothing but good. We are to devote our entire being to you, the gracious God who has made us. And we fail to do that. Forgive us for the way that we do not love our neighbors as ourselves. Those nearest to us, certainly those who who are enemies of you. Lord, have mercy on us that we might not have roots of bitterness in our hearts. But Lord, in repentance, we we cry out to you to turn us to you, to humble us in our pride and in our iniquity. Lord, we know that you are a God who forgives sins. So have mercy on our souls. Forgive us for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We might be lovers of good. And pray for those who persecute us. In Jesus' name, amen. To you who are unwilling to confess your sins, you, you make yourself an enemy of God. But God will receive you as his son or his daughter if you repent and look to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to him today. But to you who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, hear the promises of God's grace and mercy to you from the book of Romans. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Dear Christian, I declare to you who are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, though your sins are great and many, that you are forgiven of all your sins. The record of your transgressions is blotted out, and your everlasting salvation is hidden in Christ, who will resurrect you on the last day. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Let us sing uh, together. To the Lord, let us sing in Christ alone. Would you stand with us and sing Christ alone, found in your bulletin? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, 
here in the love of Christ I'll stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, his gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory his curse is lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his Please be seated. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 12. The Christian life is, is often described as a race. It's certainly not a sprint. Is it? It's an endurance race with many obstacles before us. And we see too here in our passage, there's sin, weariness, and even the Lord in His correction is helping us on our way, but it is so difficult at times to endure. So here, the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which we all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. 
shall we much not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Little children, I guess all children of God, consider him, we are told here, consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. And yet we endure what feels like hostility from God when we sin. God chastises his children not with hostility, not with wrath, but for our good. Did you hear that? And so when you are chastised, when you are afflicted for the glory of God, it says here, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Thank God for it. Love God for it. Nor be weary when reproved by him. That is the hard part, isn't it? (laughs) And so I say to you, when you are enduring the Lord's chastisement, Sometimes it's on account of a particular sin. Sometimes it's just generally to humble you and make you more like Christ. Thank Him. Rejoice in Him. Hope in that Christ-likeness. Consider Him who endured such hostility from sinners. Consider Him whose loving hand is upon you to make you more and more like Himself. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite um, a few families up, the Kohlers and the Cuts, come forward. God has blessed uh, these families with children. And God, um, God instituted a great and, and glorious promise. Everyone can come on up. But come over to the side, if you will. You know, God is such a good and gracious God. We all are here because of God's sovereign grace. And God, you know, he told us how to make disciples. Do you remember the Lord Jesus Christ, some of his last words on earth, where we are to make disciples by baptizing and teaching everything he's commanded. And you notice the order is kind of interesting. People make, you know, small light of the order, but the order is to baptize and to teach. Now, sometimes people get converted later in life, baptize them and then we disciple them in the church but God instituted baptism and baptism is a water rite it's a water ordeal and the water points to a couple of very beautiful things one is the need of these young precious girls for the cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleansed from their sin as we all do as many of us have the water also points to the pouring out of the Holy Spirit that alone can turn infant and adult and very sinful hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. And so that water, though, is actually a seal of God's covenant promise. Way back in Genesis 17, God gave this gracious, glorious promise to Abraham. I will be a God to you and to your offspring. And he instituted circumcision. Circumcision is kind of a wild, right? Girls would not receive that, right? The boys would receive it. It was a bloody rite. It was a partial cutting off of the flesh. And you remember our Lord Jesus Christ when he came on earth, he, he, the, the prophet Isaiah says that he was cut off from the land of the living. He was fully circumcised upon the cross. He shed all of his blood so that we could be forgiven. But the thing that circumcision pointed to was this promise. Hear the word of the Lord from uh, Genesis chapter 17. It's a beautiful covenant promise. Way back near the beginning of your Bible. Genesis 17, God institutes circumcision. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you 
and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and your offspring after you. And you know that the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth loving, doing ministry, and the cross was coming on the horizon. Do you remember his words in Luke? He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it's accomplished. And you think, Jesus, you were baptized by John in that muddy river Jordan two and a half years ago. What baptism are you referring to? He was referring to that baptism and that flood of God's wrath where he would be buried in judgment upon the cross to bear the sins of all who would look to him. And there is no more need for a bloody rite. But this water rite points to their need to be cleansed by the blood of Christ. It points to God's promise to be a God to them. And that promise is greater than your sin. And hopefully it will overcome their sin, won't it? And parents, there's a great obligation you have to raise your children in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. And to pray for them. You know, when they can't sing, just you know, hum the, the words to the songs in your heart as we worship the Lord. As they get older, hey, just remember one thing from the sermon. As you've had a long day at work, a long day mothering, hey, let me tell you just one verse. Let's sing the doxology and pray. May you lead your kids in the ways of the Lord, and may God continue to bring salvation to your homes. God is so faithful. He loves to save, especially those of, of believing households. And so let us pray the Lord's blessing upon um, the sacrament. Father, these young girls are not bringing themselves to the font. They are not presenting their own righteousness. These parents are merely trusting you to fulfill what you've promised, that you'll be a God not just to them, but to their children, to their offspring. So we thank you for the girls, Lord. We, we ask that you would be glorified in their salvation, Lord. Certainly, we hope and pray for that. We pray their parents to, to raise them in you, Lord. And as they sin, they know that, that you are a gracious God who cleanses sinners who come to you in the Lord. Oh, Father, be glorified in our church. In Jesus' name. Let's come back to the font and we have some vows. You guys can stay here now. And then just right over here. Some vows for the parents first, and then a vow for you, dear church. Dear parents, do you acknowledge your child's need for the cleansing blood of Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? How do you respond? We do. Do you claim God's covenant promises in their behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation as you do for your own? How do you respond? We do. Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God? And promise and humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before them a godly example, that you will pray for them, that you will teach them the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How do you respond? We do. Amen. Well, dear congregation, if you're members of the church, please stand. We have a vow for you. Do you as a congregation receive Lenora Cutts and Audrey Kohler as infant members of this church? Do you promise to surround them with Christian love, to pray for them, to set before them an example of genuine Christian faith and virtue in hope that they might know the rich fellowship of the kingdom of God and the reality of personal salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ? Congregation, how do you respond? We do. Amen. Please be seated. God has made an everlasting covenant of God to you and to your offspring, and that to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved.
Lenora Cutts, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father and God, we thank you for this precious child that you love, that you've created for your glory. We thank you for the marriage of Noah and Tori, that salvation has come to their home. We pray for this precious child, that she would never know a day where she does not know your love and grace. Oh, Father, be merciful to her that you might one day forgive her sins and receive her for eternal life in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's your middle name? Audrey Joy Kohler, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Audrey Joy. With great joy, you created her, knitting her together in her mother's womb. With great joy, you've placed the waters upon her head this day. You've placed your name upon her. You've promised to be her God, O oh Lord. May you save her. May you draw her to yourself and help her to know the love of God. Love her well through her dear sisters. Love her well through her parents and the body of Christ that she might be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us uh, stand and, and sing together. Uh, shine on us, O oh Lord. Let us sing to the Lord together. Please be seated. Let us go to the Lord together as his children in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that we, we come to you, the one who is our God, and our loving and gracious, merciful Father, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. A God who even this day has assured us that we are 
forgiven of our iniquity and our, our sin and our guilt. And so, Lord, we come resting in You this day. There are so many storms in our life, so many tests and trials and afflictions that we experience, so many burdens that we carry. And so help us to to press on as our Savior did for the joy set before us. Oh, Father, we need Your strength and Your grace. We are so weak and feeble and frail, and so we pray to You, the God who is a fortress and a strong tower to Your people. Lord, You are the Lord, our provider. And we come to acknowledge that all that we have comes from Your hand. Our very bodies and souls, our lives, who we are, we exist for You and for Your glory. The things You've given us, money, property, spiritual gifts, Oh, Father, we commit them to You. We surrender ourselves to You even this day. We bring all of our sin. We bring all of that goodness that You've wrought in and through us. And we say, here we are, send me. Lord, send us even as we come to Your throne. Send us out of this place refreshed, comforted, with resolve to live for You no matter what may come in this life, no matter the challenges in the home or on the job or in the Marine Corps or in the world. We know that You are a God who, who not only sees but hems us in behind Him before. We thank You that You, the Lord of hosts, go before us, that You are our rear guard, Whom shall we fear? What can man do to us? Oh, many things, oh Lord. But you tell him, you tell us to fear him who can destroy the body, not just the body and the soul, but cast the soul into hell. What a sobering thought that is. So we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who endured the hell that we deserve, so that we could rest in him this day. Refresh us with your love. Father, we pray for those who are suffering. We think of uh, Marilyn, who has lost Eric. Help her to mourn as those who have hope. We thank you that he is in glory with you, well in soul. We pray for John and Leslie Kerr as John continues to battle the medical affliction. Have mercy on him. Provide what he needs, O Lord. Spiritual grace. Right medicine, we ask. We pray for Paula Calloway. We thank you for her. We thank you for her family, Lord. Would you strengthen her as she continues to receive these cancer treatments? Have mercy upon her. And Lord, we pray for ourselves. All of us walk into this place struggling, some with besetting sin, others with great depression. Some of us so broken with much shame, we we can barely lift our eyes to look to you for help. And so we ask, Lord, would you, as the Psalms pray, turn us to you that we may be turned. Turn us to you this day as we worship you. Turn us to you even this week as we encounter tests and trials. Turn us to you in thankfulness and praise. For you are our holy God. And we are your people. And Lord, guide us as we pray that prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, just a quick word from the Lord as we worship Him with our giving. Paul says the ministry of the service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Isn't that a great verse? (laughs) Your service, the, the little that you give, however much or however little, may it overflow 
to meet the needs of the saints and, and the fruit of which give many thanksgivings for the glory of God. So ushers, come forward and give cheerfully for the glory of God. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please turn with me in the Word of God to Psalm uh, 6, Psalm chapter 6. As you uh, will hear in these 10 verses, David is having quite a rough go of it. And, and because of that, as, as we read, as you hear, it's, it's hard not to be moved with uh, great compassion for David. Uh, the Word of God tells us in the book of Proverbs that a man's soul will endure sickness but a crushed spirit who can bear. And we get the sense that as David endures the chastening of the Lord here, he's teetering on the edge of ultimate despair. It's hard to know what brought this about. It could have been a particular sin David had committed. It could have just been a general uh, tribulation to keep David humble and draw him near to the Lord. We don't really know. And that's just as well because uh, David's experience is not unique to himself, Christian. All of us who are in Christ will experience the chastening of the Lord. And it's for our good. It's, it's a common experience for all who believe. And, and you know the Lord's chastening doesn't feel good at the time, does it? But you better believe God intends good through it. And so the questions for us this morning are, how do we endure? How do we endure these Psalm 6 uh, seasons in life, these dark nights of the soul? And then secondly, what do we do when we are troubled in this way? So often it's during these times of affliction that questions creep in. We see that with David here, and we are no different. We can begin to question God and, and ourselves. Everything seems to be fear, fair game, as you will see in Psalm 6, during dark nights of the soul. What, what did I do to deserve this? What can I do to get out of it? Aren't those the two questions? Those aren't bad questions. But David shows us a better way to deal with these dark nights of the soul. Here in Psalm 6, we see David turning to the Lord. And so, beloved, may we do the same. And so let us seek God's blessing. We're going to consider our passage in three parts. First, verses 1 through 3, David's prayer. Secondly, uh, David's plea there in verses 4 through 7. And then finally, in verses 8 through 10, David's confidence. So let us seek the Lord's blessing upon the reading and the preaching of his word. Our Father and God, you tell us that uh, to us not only has it been granted for us to believe in Christ Jesus, 
but we are to suffer for his sake. And so, Lord, have mercy on us. Show us again, even in this text, our weakness. That we might see your all-sufficient strength. Show us again our sin and our pride that we might be humbled. Show us again your great power and love that we might draw near to you. Our merciful God, speak to our souls this day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Hear the words of the living God. To the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Sheminith, the Psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. People of God. My soul is greatly troubled. My soul is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Beloved, you see here that David is learning to wait upon the Lord here. David is learning to wait upon the Lord. But what about you? What about you? Where where do you turn, dear Christian, when your soul is troubled? David turns to the Lord here in Psalm 6. And note, beloved, he is turning to the one who, that is ultimately behind whatever you and I may be experiencing. David here in verse 1 turns to the one who appears to have turned against him. Look at verse 1 there. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. In verses 2 and 3, David makes a request for the Lord's grace and healing for the anguish of his afflicted body and soul. My bones are troubled, he says. O oh Lord, I am languishing. He prays literally, I am vexed, O oh Lord, body and soul. What a rough go for God's servant here. Poor David, things seem pretty dicey for him, don't they, here in verses 1 through 3. And if we take things just at face value, it will almost seem that as if David is amplifying his, his misery, that he's embellishing things a bit. But I assure you, he is not. Look at verse 3 there. My soul is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? How how long must this go on? It's like that 70s song. How long has this been going on, right? How long must this go on? Perhaps you've been in a similar situation, utterly miserable, feeling like the Lord is against you. Could be on account of your sin, could just be a generally uh, general humbling of the Lord. In those moments, when you're experiencing that, I, I must tell you, that is not the worst place to be, Christian. And let me tell you why. Though misery in this life at times, the misery, the trials, the, the, the afflictions of the loss, of the suffering, the misery of the Lord's chastisement and correction, what do they all have in common? They are all so often very painful, aren't they? Amen? <laughs> they are difficult to endure to bear, and we would not choose them for ourselves unless you were just super holy. Give me that. And we endure great trials, don't we, and suffering and affliction and misery. But it's not the worst place to be, and let me tell you why. 
Because they're all meant to do a couple of things. Number one, they're meant to draw you closer to God. Don't ever forget that. They're meant to draw you closer to God. Secondly, they're meant to make you more like Jesus. The trials, the sufferings, the afflictions, the chastisements are instruments through which God draws us near to himself in prayer. They're experiences and seasons through which God makes us more like Christ. And the question we have to wrestle with this morning, beloved, is that worth it to you? Is being more like Christ worth it to you? I'll tell you that now. And I know you know. I know it from my own life. It's worth it. It is so worth it. Help our unbelief. Amen. Let me assure you, there is no better place to be than than to be more like Christ. No better place to be for, for hell and high water to draw you near to God, the one who is a refuge and a loving fortress for his people. You think of the metaphors of refuge and fortress. They tell us a lot about God, don't they? But they presuppose something about us. And what's that? That we are weak and often need in need of protection and shelter. We so often, like David, are facing uh, and experiencing great misery. Whether it's on account of our sin or just living in a sinful world. And, and the thing about our misery is that God's mercy presupposes our misery, doesn't it? And Christian, God's mercy is so much greater than your misery. The way that God receives David here, the way that God receives you is so often, it's beyond words. David had good theology this morning. David knows God is sovereign over all things. But I imagine what causes David the greatest sorrow, what exceeds all of his other sorrows, his bones, his tears, is that he's feeling that, that, that God might be against him. You ever felt like that? When you're miserable in this life, God is not against you. You must have faith to know that God is for you. God is not opposing you in wrath. All of God's wrath toward you was placed upon the shoulders and in the flesh of his beloved son upon that cross. There is no wrath left for you. Do you know what's left for you, Christian? Mercy is left for you. It's all mercy. You know, we can doubt a lot of things in those storms when we feel like David in Psalm 6, but don't doubt that God is for you. God is for you to make you like himself, to draw you to himself. One commentator said of, of, of our experience, of David's experience here, Thus it seems to us that God does not want to accept us. It seems that God appears to be our enemy. That God wants to surrender us to the devil right now. Thus it feels as if we have entered the very mouth and courtyard of hell. But then he adds, from which God's people are always delivered. Amen. God may have brought you right up to the precipice. Those very dark seasons of body and soul. But God has saw you through, hasn't he? And he will see you through, Christian. In those times when it feels like we've tiptoed right up to the near the very edge of hell itself, you know what's behind all that? A loving, fatherly chastisement. A mysterious, good, loving, fatherly providence to make us more and more like Jesus and more humble and more holy. May that be worth it to you, dear Christian. And by way of application, I would say, don't lose sight of that great end. You know, when we're mired in misery, what mistake do we often make? We make the mistake of assuming that we're forsaken by God. Or that God is opposed to us. That God is far away. You know what he is in those situations? He's too close for comfort. 
God is near you to humble you. Remember the language in 1 Peter. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your cares on him, knowing that he cares for you. His mighty hand is a little too close for comfort. What must you do? Pray. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Don't lose sight of that. God's working a greater and greater Christ-likeness in you, his beloved child. One theologian has said that the pains we experience in this life are medicinal, not viral. They're medicinal. They're meant to make us more like Christ. As we have to cling to God's promises. As we draw near to God and participate more and more in the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Christ-likeness is the great end of your existence. And it's the goal of whatever you're experiencing even this day, beloved. And so may God give you grace to endure. May you not lose sight of God's mercy towards you. I'll just say one more thing about David here in these first three verses. At least he's praying. At least he's praying, Christian. And therefore there is hope for David and hope for us, beloved. And so keep praying. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. God loves you. Martin Luther says, uh, to all suffering people, time seems long. And to the joyous, time seems short. But time seems immeasurably long to those who have this internal herd of soul, feeling forsaken and rejected by God. Christian, keep praying. Even if you have to pray the words of verse 3, my soul is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? It's a beautiful prayer. But you notice David doesn't stop there, does he? Let us look to his plea here. Our second point in verses 4 through 7, God, David prays for God to deliver him. You see his experience in verses 6 and 7. He floods his couch with tears. He thinks of his own death. Notice what he says there in verse 4. Turn, literally, uh, he pleads with the Lord, return, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Turn again, O Lord, or, or literally return, O Lord. You know, when you're going through it, in a sense, he's, he's recollecting on former times, isn't he? <laughs> return. Restore. He wants to feel once again the sweetness of God's presence rather than the bitterness of the discomfort. And again, you notice in verse 4, it's important. We saw it last week. We see it again this week. David is invoking not his own merits, but the covenant faithfulness of God. The steadfast love of the Lord, he says here. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. And I will say to you, Christian, um, Always ground your pleas, almost always, in the goodness and the character and the promises of God. You know, but it's that statement in verse 5. It's elicited much debate, much confusion. Do you, you see that verse there? For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? Should we base our whole theology about the afterlife off this verse? What do you think? <laughs> Should we do that based on one who's suffering what feels like hell? Probably not. You know, some commentators will say, oh, this proves that many of the Old Testament saints doubted there was an afterlife. Or whether they had any hope of ongoing communion with God. And perhaps David may have felt that way. He's in a dark place after all. I'm sure all of us to varying degrees when facing bitter hardship have felt and thought all sorts of things that were opposed to reality and to God and to God's truth. You know, Psalm 30, David prays a similar prayer after the Lord delivered him. He says, Lord, you restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. And then he gives um, almost a replay of the situation. I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. <laughs> you hid your face and I was dismayed. Do you see the humbling there? And then he talks about his dismay there in Psalm 30. Listen to what he says. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? And then he closes, I will give thanks to you forever. And of course we will praise God in glory, won't we? 
But you know we only get one chance to praise God in this life. Yes, Christian, you will praise God as glorified saints on the new heavens and the new earth in your immortal body and your incorruptible soul. But Christian, you only get one chance to praise Him in this life in the midst of this present evil age. And we get the sense that David prays here um, the way he does, just not so he could feel better. He prays here the way he does, just so he do- not just so he doesn't die. He's basically saying, Lord, I want to remain in this life. Not languishing, not feeling cast off under your wrath. I want to remain in this life so that I can praise you. So that I can praise you in this life. And I say to you, dear Christian, once God calls you home, that's it. No more praising Him in this life. You praise Him in glory to be sure, but your faithful God has placed you in this life, this present evil age filled with trials and sufferings and tests that you might praise God. And may you be better than Job. Remember the language of Job? Though He slay me, yet I will trust Him. Do that, Christian. But though He slay you, may you praise Him He is worthy of your praise even when He slays you, even when He humbles you, even in those dark nights of your soul. Draw near to Him and trust and praise Him with your lips. Yesterday, um, kind of a long day, we had an 11-hour, not an 11-hour presbytery meeting, but it's a couple hours each way and it's a long meeting. And we were on our way home, weary and well-doing, perhaps you could say that, just weary. <laughs> And the elders and I were talking in the car, three of us together, about how forward we were looking to Sunday to gather with the saints and to worship God and to praise God and to be refreshed by God and to be healed by God, our gracious God. David wants to praise the Lord here in the land of the living, and so must we, even in our misery. Yes, Christian, I know you long to be with the Lord. I know this life is hard, but praise Him today. Continue to praise Him until that great, glorious day when God calls you home. David's plea wants to praise God in life. But notice David's change here, finally, in verses 8 through 10. David goes from crying his eyes out in verses 6 and 7 to confidence in the Lord as he concludes. What changed? We get the sense the change wasn't brought about because uh, David was healed by God, nor, nor was the change brought about because God brought some prophet. The change is brought about because David is confident that God heard his weeping and heard his prayer. You know what, beloved? It's so great to be heard, isn't it? And to be understood. Especially when you're miserable. And there is no one who hears and understands like your Lord. Look what David says. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. And Christian, so too with you. The God who sees you knows you. He knows your burdens. He knows your fears. He knows the sound of your weeping. And God just does not know He loves you. And by way of application, I must remind you as we close, the mercy of God will always be towards you, beloved. Even in your greatest hours of misery, Especially in your moments of great misery, God will be there with the greatest mercy. Even when God brings you to a place where you are languishing and you cry out with David here, my soul is greatly troubled. God will be merciful towards you. 
And the reason why God can be merciful towards you and deliver you in your misery is because there is one who like David and like us took this prayer upon his lips. Beloved, there is mercy for you in your misery because there is one who came to this earth. And though being God in the flesh, cried out to God the Father the same words of David here in the psalm with the cross looming on the horizon, with enemies circling your Savior like jackals, with the disciples on the cusp of betraying and forsaking Him. Do you remember your Savior's cry that night? John 12. Now my soul is troubled, Jesus said there. And what shall I say? You know, there's a lot of things Jesus could have said. Oh Lord, deliver me. He could have said that. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Your Savior prayed with a troubled soul greater than David's, greater than yours or mine. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. There is mercy for you in your misery, beloved, because the author of life chose not to be delivered. There's mercy for you, beloved, because the Lord Jesus Christ endured such darkness of body and soul. There is even darkness over the entire land as he bore your sins in his body on the cross, as he died upon the cross. The word of God tells us the punishment, the chastisement that brings us peace, the wrath of God was upon your Savior who says for you, for this purpose I have come to this hour, glorify your name and glorify the Father's name. Your loving Savior did. And so now, beloved, when you experience misery in this life, and you will, may you always see it as an opportunity to share in the sufferings of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And may you prayerfully lean into the mercy of your loving Lord. You see, the one who came for that hour of misery is the one who is ever merciful to his own. The one who bled, the one who suffered, the one who died for us is ever merciful to you, those he loves. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, I've learned to kiss the wave that dashes me against the rock of ages. And Christian, sometimes you get seasick learning to kiss that wave. And so may the Lord have mercy on our troubled souls. And God's people said, Amen. Our Father and God, thank you that your mercy is greater than our misery. And that you love us and that you draw us near to you. Sometimes humbling us so great we have nowhere else to turn. Oh Lord, increase our faith in your love and your grace and the greatness of your mercy. In the work that you are doing in our lives through all circumstances to make us more like Jesus. May we see it as, as worth it. And may you increase our faith even as we sing, as we come to your table. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us um, sing uh, to the Lord together, standing and lifting our voices uh, and sing eternal uh, weight of glory. Now the days and hours and moments of our suffering seem so long And the toilsome waiting and 
wondering, threatening silence to our song. Now the pain is real and pressing, where our faith is thin and weak. But our hope is set on Jesus as we cling to Him our strength. For behold, I tell a mystery at the trumpet sound will wake. Death is swallowed up in victory when we meet a king of grace every year we thought was wasted every night we cried how long it will be a passing moment in our savior's victory song Oh, eternal weight of glory, O oh, inheritance divine. We will see our Lord redeeming every past and future time. All our pains will be transfigured like the scars of Christ our Lord. We will see the weight of glory and our broken years restored. For behold, I tell a mystery at the trumpet sound will wake. Death is swallowed up in victory when we meet our King of grace. Every year we thought was wasted, every night we cried how long, all will be a passing moment in our Savior's victory song. We will see our wounded Savior, we'll behold Him face to face. And we'll hear our anguished stories Sung as victory songs of grace For behold, I tell a mystery At the trumpet sound we'll wake Death is swallowed up in victory When we meet our King of grace Every year we thought was wasted, every night we cried how long, all will be a passing moment in our Savior's victory song. Every year we thought was wasted, every night we cried how long, all will be a passing moment in our Savior's victory song. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy 
as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts up to the Lord. Great is the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And as we partake by faith, beloved, we enter into that heavenly sanctuary where the angels are singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so let us sing the Sanctus as we prepare to come to the table. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and mind, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God who is filled with power and might, yet who veiled His glory in our own flesh and blood, who came down from heaven for us and for our salvation. The bread shows forth the weakness of your Savior, His body that was pierced for your transgressions, that was broken and crushed for your iniquities. The cup shows forth the shed blood of Christ that was poured out for a full and free remission of all of our sins. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is for those who are sheep. Those who have been baptized. Those who have made a credible profession of faith before Christ and His church. If that is not you, if you're not believing, if you're in unrepentant sin, I must warn you to abstain from these elements. This is a holy feast for the people of God. But consider the Savior and look to Him this day. Let us pray the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank You for the greatness of Your love and grace toward us in the Gospel. For the sacred holy meal of the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You for these elements. They are sacramental signs showing the great work of salvation that He's accomplished in the Gospel showing Your work of love and grace and labor for us. Oh, Father, may You by Your Spirit use them to holy ends. We are those who are in need of mercy. And so seal Your grace to our hearts. Strengthen our faith in Your goodness and Your very great salvation. And help us to eat and drink on this One who is the bread of life by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the forgiveness of their sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me of the Lord, for often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and feast upon Christ until He comes. 
All is ready, beloved. Come forward. Uh, We'll partake together as one body of Christ.
body of Christ broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Our Father and God, we thank you for your ministry to us of of worship, of word and sacrament, the way that you condescend to our, our feeble senses and our weak faith. To give Christ to us, not just in our ears by hearing, but as we, as we taste and see your goodness. Remind us that we, though sinful as we are, forgiven. That we, miserable as we are, are those who have been shown mercy. And help us to live for your glory. Oh, increase our faith in your faithfulness. That you will see us all the way home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to stand um, together and lift our hearts and our voices and our hands and sing uh, the doxology to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings The Lord has placed his name upon you in baptism. Receive his name and his blessing upon you as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.